Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. We've got a special guest for tonight's show. Of course, I'm talking about Chris Edge, who's a Dogman researcher from the state of New Jersey. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me on the show, buddy. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Chris, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm Chris Edge. I am the host of Crypto Normal X, which is a show that Vic Cundiff was a part of early this month in June. I am a butcher. I am also a, obviously, to Vic said, a dogman researcher and investigator. I'm part of the NADP for the NJ Charter. And that's basically it. <laughs> I don't know if you've thought about this before or not, Chris, but the fact that you're a butcher, that might come in handy if you ever encounter a dogman out in the field. As long as you have a cleaver strapped to your hip, I think you'll be in pretty good shape, maybe. The Rambo knife is where it's at. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that wouldn't hurt either. Chris, when was the first time you heard the term dogman? Well, I heard the term dogman back, and it was kind of surprising because it was back in 2009, and I was looking up information after watching several werewolf movies because I was, my mind was so intrigued that maybe these creatures do exist, that there are real life werewolves out there. So I did some keying and researching for about a couple hours and I looked across, didn't come up werewolf, but it said dog man and man wolf. And it was Linda Godfrey's blog, uh, The Beast of Bray Road, The Lair. And I was just looking up encounters and stories from there and just taking a look. And that's basically where it all began, you know, 2009 and doing some digging online. And then basically where it all began for me was thanks to Linda Godfrey's blog. I bought her books and... Since then, in the past seven years, you know, from listening to your show, from encounters, from eyewitnesses to looking up Jody Cook's research, as well as Linda's still, and then even just in general, Facebook groups of people who come into the groups and tell their stories. And then for me, even, you know, with that knowledge, doing my own show and having people come on and tell their encounters, also stories from people who I've ran into. Knowing about them is one thing, but what made you decide to start researching them? I wasn't fully satisfied with just hearing stories. I wanted to kind of get a little bit more out of it and just kind of do a little digging and researching of my own because I felt that for me to be satisfied and cleared talking and discussing and, you know, getting stories, I needed to kind of do a little research myself and speak to some people and then see if I can go out into the field and see if I can grab anything, see if I can find something that could show a little truth to all the skeptics or even in general to those who don't really know much about this stuff and share with them stories and then what I've uncovered and discovered in the fields of the dogman realm. That makes sense. You found out about them in 2009, you said, but how long have you been researching them? Literally, for the past seven years since 2009, it was basically where it started was just looking up that Google search. And then since then, from looking up everything and then going from there, really, that was from in the past seven years. But because since social media had evolved, I didn't really have a signature outlet, really, to get more intel until the mid 2010s with your show and then Jody Cook's website and then the Facebook groups is really where everything skyrocketed in the past two years. Have you researched any encounters there in your state? Yes, there have been five encounters that I've collected so far and possibly more, you know, it's definitely bound to happen whether some people who tune into the show in the state of New Jersey or people in the groups who listen to my show or listen to this episode of your show, that'll come forward and tell me about their stories. You know, it's always open um, opportunity for somebody to message me and say, look, you know, I saw this and that. But for now, I've had five encounters come to me in my state. Then I've had three encounters that I spoke to with permission from the groups 
to tell their story as well. Just think about all the people who do believe in dogmen who would never think that there are any dogmen in your state. It's wild because in my state, we only have the Jersey Devil that's popular. And then, of course, the Amityville Horror House. And then everything else is all just a mix and match. Very little Sasquatch reports. So it, 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 you never would think that these creatures would actually hit the East Coast in such a huge way. But Pennsylvania is right next to me. so And that's a huge hot spot for dogmen. Oh, sure. Well, when you think about New Jersey also, how much of that state is unoccupied, it only makes sense that they'd be there too. Just bound to happen, whether it was going to come out from somebody else or the people I've spoken to in general, you know, or like I said, you know, there's probably people who've had encounters that live closer to me because I do live close to the wilderness, but not and a lot, basically residential. But no question, the woods around me have probably had them running around in there and I just don't know about it. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. How close do you live to the Pine Barrens? Well, I'm about maybe a good hour and a half away because I'm in central New Jersey. And the Pine Barrens, where I live in central Jersey, is about a good, minus the traffic, about a good hour and a half away, two hours maximum. And with the Pine Barrens, basically with however much wilderness and locals there, it's just incredible that it doesn't surprise me if there's been more than just the average Joe of dogman reports or skinwalkers or cults that have been running around there because it's bound to be that that's almost close to 500 acres of just forest right there. It's wild. And I've never fully visited the Pine Barrens until obviously in August when we have an expedition come out with a couple of my friends and myself we're just going to check out the place but you know for in general just it, like you just said does not surprise me one bit about if there's multiple reports even if it was just and there's been reports of satanic cults there so i mean in the lore of the supernatural maybe but even in general with flesh and blood it's it the place is like our land between the lakes just minus the reports of murders and this and that, vice versa. But it's just wild. I mean, the Pine Barrens, I would not want to be a resident there. I would refuse to live there. Even if I had no choice, I would just consider living in a box. I would never want to live in the Pine Barrens, ever. <laughs> I can't say I'll blame you. It sure does seem like a pretty creepy place. Have you heard of any dogman encounters happening there in the Barrens? Yes. I had collected a report and... The funny thing is, too, is that it was sort of like, I guess you can kind of put it on an accident, but it just sprew out. And I found this out and it kind of links in with this story. I had uh, one of my friends had had an encounter, literally, and it was wild because it was just sort of like I said, out of the blue, you know, he had told me the story late one night and it was basically just. I was just pulling up an image. I was just going online, and then he had seen a JPEG of the infamous LBL beast sketch of Barton Nolly. And he said to me, what is that? And I said, oh, well, um, this is one of those creatures that you know I research. And he said to me, he was like, eh, what kind of creature is it? That was literally his sentence. And I said to him, you're going to think this is a little ridiculous. But this is what we call in what I do a dog man, a man wolf. And he looked at me and said, I got to tell you something. And I'm kind of nervous to tell you this because you're not going to think this happened to me. And my buddy, and I'm going to call him Alex. I'm going to give him that name. I spoke to him and he didn't want his information out except for him. He could tell, I could tell the story, but just, you know, I'm going to give him the alias of Alex. He had told me, and this happened in November of 2016, he sat there and I can tell that when he was trying to explain this because it took a while for him to tell me the story. He was nervous. He was shaking. And he had told me that he was camping out in the Pine Barrens in one of the camps. I forgot which one, but it was closer to the river of the Pine Barrens. And he was camping out with one of his buddies. And this was also in a period of time where there was the infamous clown sightings that were going on. So for him, he thought somebody was playing a prank on him. 
because out of the blue, it was about dusk. It was roughly around 5.30, 6 o'clock-ish. And he had heard screams coming from east of him. And these were screams that were like bloody murder screams, like someone getting stabbed and shrieking. His buddy said to him, I was like, what was that? In the PG expression form, there was more to it. But he went out and he had said, I don't know what that was. But, you know, I mean, if someone's playing a prank on me or if it's one of those clowns, you know, I'm definitely going to do something. So they went out and looked and, you know, he had a knife on him as protection wise. And his buddy was about maybe a couple feet away from him, just looking through the other side, just in case whatever it was, was going to come around and sneak up and, you know, be tactical about it. And he went out and he had, you know, he mimicked the scream a little bit. And then he, this was the part of the story where he was viciously shaken. I I had to calm him down and explain it to him and tell him, look, it's okay. Nothing's going to happen. And he told me full blank that he got a little closer to the screams the next second, shined his light, and he saw a face. And the face, amber eye shine, he was able to look up and see the amber eye shine because he peered down for a second because he was trying to retrace his steps and saw this face. Face snarled at him and growled and discovered what that noise was. That's when he said to his buddy, we got to get out of here now and just darted. And they're track runners. They were athletes. So they darted out of there faster than a speeding bullet. And they took their book bags they had, left their tent, left the food they had, and just left. They got out. They got into his Jeep and darted out of the Pine Barrens. And they were so shooken up that they had to pull over when they finally got to a, like a convenience store in the closer residential It took them about a couple seconds, like literally just to sit there and relax their minds and question, what did they just see? And he broke down at this point, telling me the story. And I looked at him and I was like, dude, you got to relax. Like, it's okay. I mean, now that you're telling me this, you know, I'm not going to sit there and like point and laugh at you. I, you know, and as he, he, since he's a buddy of mine, you know, having that friend talk, trying to, you know, make him feel better because he was like, whatever he saw definitely freaked him out so bad that in many ways he hasn't returned to that place since and he's very cautious about going into the woods in general he still goes out there and there but what he saw that night definitely traumatized him and you know i feel bad for him in a way because you know he he's one of those people that you know can stand by anything you know he can like run into people who are going to try to fight him or intimidated. But when he saw that, you know, that, that was where his heart stopped and, you know, how he described it to me at the end of the um, conversation. And at this point I had like a full book of notes. That's basically the one encounter I collected in the Pine Barrens from him, which was pretty like irrelevant since we were talking about camping and expeditions in various places, just in general that night. So that that's the one encounter I had from the Pine Barrens. Did you ever go into more detail about what that face that he saw looked like? The first thing I did was I also pulled up a chart of the seven types, and I showed to him each type. What did it look like? And when he shined the light, he saw what would look like the portion of a pointy ear. So he saw he definitely saw a canine variant, and then he saw the face and i showed him the the portrait of the variant three it said it had that attribute that facial expression that attribute physical appearance of that canine variant three but he also said that it looked a lot more similar and very much so like the sketch from the lbl the barton oli sketch which is an infamous sketch so that's when i kind of sat there and i said to him i was like are you sure because he was like, I'm, I'm very serious, you know, and he was fidgeting a little bit because, you know, I guarantee you the more I talked to him about this encounter, the more he was getting more and more terrified and, you know, losing his mind a little bit because he was this definitely left him bothered for a while and still does. Since then, though, he's been comfortable about it. But in the description of what he told me, it had a huge a whole lot looking like the uh, LBL sketch. No wonder it shook him up so much. Oh, absolutely. 
I felt bad, like I said, and I gave him a big hug and said, look, man, I appreciate you. You came out and you let it out. But I was like, I hope you never see that ever again, because if I ever saw the L, like that sketch, that depiction of the creature in the LBL sketch, that's rough. That's probably one of the scariest sketches I've ever seen. I'm not exaggerating. That's just my honest opinion. Yeah, it doesn't get much worse than that. All right, Chris, you've collected quite a few other encounters. Please share as many of those encounters with us as you can. Well, the next couple of encounters I'm going to talk about came from Somerset County, New Jersey, which is up north by Newark and Trenton. But there's also a heavily wooded population there as well. This was a report I collected about a year ago, but this is where I started getting into my research a little bit more. And I looked up information from your website, and there was nothing about New Jersey, and there was information about very little in the Pennsylvania and New York region. So I did some digging, and I looked up a couple websites. I came across WordPress. I put in the search engine, Werewolf New Jersey, Dogman New Jersey, and I found the top on WordPress that said, A Werewolf Sighting in New Jersey. This is coming from a guy. I'm going to give him the alias of Mike. He hasn't used his WordPress since... July of 2015, but maybe if he's still around, maybe this episode can kind of help him because I am retelling his story. But his story, I'll even send you the link to the WordPress document. This goes back June 2010. He was driving with his girlfriend in this place in Somerset. I don't just remember the precise road exactly or in the description of his blog, he didn't say, but he was driving alongside this road in Somerset County. And all of a sudden, about maybe 100 feet from him, this this giant creature, and it sounds to me like it kind of looked like the howling werewolf because he, he described it as being extremely tall, pointy ears. His creature ran across the road just dodging his car, and it just kept on running. And he, he stopped for a second, him and his girlfriend, because she was in the car as well, had said, what was that? Basically. They looked at it one more time before pressing on and just left. But it was a short encounter, but the creature, from how he describes it, was at least roughly eight feet tall. Pointy ears, like I said, look like the howling werewolf. The way he's describing it sounds exactly like the howling werewolf for the canine variant 2, the hyena type. And the funny – now, this is the interesting part. He said that this creature had black eyes. Now, whether that was a reflection of the vehicle headlights or he got a good look at it while it was strolling, he said it had black eyes. And it sounds to me, and I remember when I was talking to another former guest of yours about it, you know, he was talking about the woo for a little bit and black eyes looking dog men. And, you know, that's one of the other types that's been talked about with the besides the amber eye shine, the red eye shine, blue eye shine, etc. You know, the black eyes. And to me, coming from me personally, that sounds a whole lot creepier than the amber eyes. That That's terrifying. I would hate to look at my bedroom window and see that. But he described and also that it had like scaly fur, like not as much fur, but it, it was there. But it was a very brief encounter, so he didn't really go on to detail. But he basically said at the end of his blog that, you know, has anybody else had any encounters in Somerset County? Have anybody else had this and that? Blah, 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 blah. Because it sounds to me when he wrote that article, and that's I really wish I was able to come across it back in 2010. I don't know why I didn't think about that for a while, but at the time I was not that much of a researcher then. But I saw his blog literally a while back and, you know, I tried messaging him, like I said, never got a response. So I don't necessarily know if he saw this thing again or if he kind of took the information from the blog and just left it at that. But it sounds to me that whatever he saw and it didn't sound at all like something you would rationally see like a bear or regular bear just yeah bear in general in that area and somerset's filled with some woodland like not as much as pine barrens but it's there so that's one report that came out of somerset the next report actually it was part of a comment that came from a commenter who read that blog who's also from somerset 
This is another very brief one. I'm not really going to go into it as much because there's nothing much to discuss about it. But the woman who talked about this encounter, it wasn't much of an encounter. It was much of just instinct. And I know a lot of researchers, I know a lot of eyewitnesses have this instinct of being watched. And everybody feels like they're being watched. I mean, I feel being watched sometimes when I'm walking on a trail in the woods or if I'm going outside at night to just maybe, you know, bored and just going for a walk in my cul-de-sac or my neighborhood. I, you always get that feeling. But she had a bad feeling like like it was instinct almost like her like mind was kind of like toying with her. And as people sometimes I've noticed this a whole lot with dog men talking telepathically to somebody, you know, she was just sitting there in the dining room one night and felt like she was being watched and something was sort of like kind of messing with her in a way. Like she just felt like her brain was telling her things not to do or this and not to like even discuss, like don't go outside or, you know, don't go towards the window. And you could see the comment in, in the blog, but you know, that was interesting to put out because it sounds to me like that's one person from Somerset who's had an encounter or with something there that they know the stories of. And if there is a werewolf or dog man of Somerset County, then I would highly recommend people who come on and listen to this episode. If you are from the Somerset region and you are in New Jersey and have heard about it, feel free to send me a message or Vic a message because it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to get more dirt out of this town. The final incident that comes from Somerset came from a woman who was also a commenter on this blog. I'm going to call her Maria. She had said that she had had an encounter with so – she didn't have it physically ver like fright, but she saw something walking casually down this uh, road of a creature – that looked very similar and sounds very similar to the creature that I discussed in the first incident. She sat there in her bedroom laying in bed and she had her window open. Well, the blinds weren't shutting the window from outside, but the window was closed. But basically, you know, she was able to see outside what I meant. And she had saw this creature, just stray hair, sort of like the hyena type again, walking down the road casually. And she got up and took a look closer and she was thinking to herself, am I seeing things? Like, is this like a dream? Which is what 90% of people probably think in these encounters. And she's just sitting there and she sees this like thing and she's kind of analyzing it. And it's walking casually bipedal at first. And then this is interesting. It just stops for a second, begins to get down on its knees and hind legs and just runs into the woods just on all fours that was interesting to me and you can even see it in the blog she was just completely freaked out and it reminds me of an incident of a creature like that walking casually down the road when i interviewed jody jody cook the founder of nadp he said to me in an interview when i was talking to him he said that, you know, there was an incident in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which is home to the Mothman encounters, paranormal men in black, for some people who didn't know. And he was telling me a story how there's this government facility that's not too far off from the area. We were talking about surveillance footage being, you know, dismantled and being erased, quote unquote. And there was this uh, small residential area where people saw this creature, this werewolf looking creature not a guy in a costume because he was too bulky and didn't resemble that of a guy in an outfit didn't look too fabricated to him when he was being told the story just walking casually down the road and it's interesting because it seems to me like these creatures tend to when there's no one around or when in this case because it was a government facility nearby their conspiracy theories can go up and down that these creatures do have the instincts of walking casually like a normal human being that they have that intelligence and it was weird but anyways going back to the subject she was basically creeped out i haven't said anything to her because again some of these people like the girl and the original guy who posted the post mike they haven't been on their wordpress so i don't know for sure what they really if they're still seeing these things or if mike's encounter was just going casually just in the area and just trying to get to another county such as newark and as for the girl maria i don't know much about her except for what she wrote but hopefully if like i said they see this show or listen to the show they 
say something or say, look, you know, I, I read your story. And, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about more, if you've had any more encounters, please tell me. But that's the Somerset saga for what I know now. The last story I've collected from New Jersey comes from one of my other buddies. And I'm going to call him Ricky. Ricky, you know, straightforward, takes no crap from nobody type guy. He is also into the whole game tournaments such as, you know, Pokemon and, you know, speed run game tournaments, you know, all goes to charity, this and that. And he was uh, leaving a tournament in um, East Rutherford and he was going to go visit his aunt who lives in Monmouth County and Monmouth County off the border of Howell and Jackson, New Jersey is very populated with woods. You can travel a mile and a half and you'll see a house, a shack, that's a house. And then next couple miles down is another house. So it's heavily wooded. He was driving down, uh, going – because his – like I said, his aunt lives in Mama, so he's going to pay a visit to her. And he was driving alongside – there's a couple ways you can get to Mammoth if you're coming from up north. You can take the parkway and the turnpike and then you can go down a couple dirt roads but you'll be on a dirt road for a little while if you're taking the back roads but other than that he you know was coming off the back roads and he was off this dirt road and he had seen this creature just out of the blue like it would cross the road but it leaped now many cases i've been also looking at lately it just seemed to be leaping like they, the creatures tend to leap, which is interesting. He thought it was a creature that was um, a bear that was limping because it looked like it was limping when he was telling me the story. And he slowly just, you know, drove right up to it, pulled out his mechanic flashlight, which is known for people who work on cars, a little small flashlight, peered out and saw amber eye shine and saw this to what he described it as an ugly and just growled at him like, you know, like a type growl. And that's when he just put it in drive and just floored it out of there. And he wouldn't surprise me the way he is. He probably, you know, put enough dirt to have that creature cough and he darted out of there. And when Ricky told me this story, you know, I was finishing up an episode of my show and, you know, he was showing me some of his uh, modifications made to his car. And then, you know, out of the blue, one of my guests notified me about the show saying thanks again. And that's when he said, uh, what do you research exactly? Because I spoke to him for a little bit and he said, oh, you know, just, you know, paranormal, Sasquatch, this and that. And these are things that, like I said, you know, you can't really when you know your friends, this and that you you don't ever want to make them think you're crazy for looking this stuff up. But Rick told me that what he saw wasn't no bear, but it was definitely that of a cryptid that looked exactly like a dog, man. I pulled him back into my house and said, look, I'm going to take this pen and paper and I'm going to start taking some notes. Uh, and I always tell him, I was like, you better not be lying to me. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm telling you straight out what I saw. He told me his story. And then I pulled up a chart of the seven types and it's funny, again, another person pulling up, the K9 Variant 3, looked a whole lot like the K9 Variant 3, the Van Helsing werewolf. And he said in his description, too, it was kneeling down, but it looked like it was roughly, like it was pretty tall, pointy ears, amber eye shine, black hair, but it was at night, so it was um, most likely brown, but... You know, when he shined the light, the first thing he saw were the fangs. And that was enough to convince him that this wasn't your average bear. And it looked at him with those amber eyes and it did that little like growl. And that's all it took for him to just to bolt out of there. In conclusion to his story, too, I don't know his aunt. And I'm going to ask him, remind him, because I, I tend to forget sometimes with him. If he can try to like tell his aunt if he's if she's had any activity in the area because this happened off the border of Jackson and Howell Township, so this is right in the heart of the heartland of the woods. And a funny thing I'm going to bring up too is that there's a bunch of in those woodlands satanic rituals that have gone down. Apparently, there's rumors of the Ku Klux Klan being in that area, 
And I don't think it has anything to tie in. They probably know of it, but it doesn't surprise me if it's just Dog Man. But they also have a bunch of Sasquatch encounters there, too. The, the Jackson and Monmouth County, Powell especially, there's so many woods that are in that area. There's no question that there's something that's out there besides bear. It's mostly home to black bear. I used to live in Jackson for a couple years, but it was in residential. But even then, though, a creature that could be in the woods that are far behind my back of the house in the backyard, no question that there's something that could, you know, kill a rabbit, kill a deer and, you know, a cat and make you question, well, what made it did that? And, you know, of course, I sat there and went after Ricky told me this story. That was when I was fully convinced that, you know, there's, there's definitely more out there than just what people are telling me. There was that story, and then that was that, and then the three Somerset County stories. So those are basically what I've collected from the state of New Jersey. The next three stories I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the first one that's brief. This one comes from a group member of the Dogman group that I'm a part of. He had explained to us that he had had something eight feet tall off the ground bang on his house several times and it creeped him out because he felt like he was being watched regardless and whatever it was he was so creeped out by it that he was like i don't know what to do i didn't say nothing but just in my mind we'll have to wait and see how it plays out because if when it comes to how you see these creatures, whether they want to mess with you or you did something to get them ticked off, you got to hear the full story out in order to get a full understanding. And I've noticed that a whole lot now that I've become more advanced in research with these creatures that it's best to listen. And if you have to take notes and, you know, if it takes two hours, three hours to hear everything out, then that's what it takes. So. You know, he was very brief, but, you know, since then we haven't heard nothing yet. I'm still waiting for him to say something. But if for eight feet tall off the ground and hear the banging, if he has photographs of dents, if he has photographs of footprints, you know, he knows where to go. But then there is this interesting – now, this is an interesting story. This is actually one I'm really interested to tell you and to everybody who listens. This story comes from a woman – who messaged me for advice. And this is a woman I'm going to call Jane. She lives and she did not give her whereabouts except that where she lives, there's a Creek and she takes her dog who is a bloodhound. And for people who don't know much about bloodhounds, they're very, they're guard dogs. They're very popular Southern dogs. You know, they don't, they're not afraid of much. They're not even afraid of other animals. They'll growl at dogs, fight with other dogs if they want to. One day she was walking her dog down this creek and it was this route that she had chosen. This dog was so terrified of whatever was around there that it was behind her and it was weeping, crying, and it wanted to leave. So she did that. And on her way back, she discovered these teeth that were on the ground. And I was kind of curious at that part of the story because I said to her, I was like, well, I mean, did you bother to even think of maybe it was just a different animal or what you're taking? You might not want to take. And she didn't know that at the time, but she was telling me that when she had found these teeth, she just had an unnerving like feel of being watched. And when she was down in this creek, she left – and then a couple nights go by and the activity began with just banging around the house and just, you know, something was in the area. And then she messaged me a few nights later saying that I saw a shadow pass by my window. There's something out here. I can hear something. I'm crying, Chris. I need you to help me right now. I don't know what to do. I'm really terrified, shaking in my bed in tears. And I tell her, I was like, Jane, listen to me right now. If anything, if it gets out of line, if you had something to do with the teeth, if you had something to do with making its disturbance in its territory, whether you touched a marked area First of all, first and foremost, and it might have not been the smart thing to do, but I told her to pray. I told her just look. 
Maybe if you pray, it'll go away, this and that. And I told her the first thing you do the next day is you go out there, return those teeth. I don't care if you have to apologize. I don't care if you have to just leave it and throw it as long as they get the teeth. And at that point, I was convinced that she definitely touched something that was theirs and it got them pissed. And it was to the point where, you know, she eventually returned the teeth but she had had a couple of visitations within around that portion. She disappeared from the Facebook groups for a little bit due to a, um, a fallout with a fellow member. And this is the weird part. I had a dream last week. In my dream, she was in it, and there was a fathead. For people who don't know what a fathead is, it is the soldier type dog man. I like to call them the rogues because those are the types that will attack anything, even other dog men. I had a dream and then she was captured by one and this creature took her away from her house. And I was somehow in the dream and was in this area. And then I woke up and I was like, whoa. So I messaged one of my administrators of this dog man group I'm a part of. And I said, look, something's bothering me, man. I had this dream about this girl that I spoke to and I told him, I was like, you remember that girl, Jane? Cause he also helped out and pitched in and you know, he messaged and reached out to her and we found out she was okay because she had left the group a couple months after the incident. So she was rightfully, she was perfectly fine. Nothing happened. She returned the teeth. She shared with my administrator a photograph of footprints, which I will show you and send you a link to Vic because these are pretty interesting. You should see the footprints on these things. Hair sample that she collected. And she described the creature as it being a gray, dark haired, eight foot tall pointy eared gremlin that almost like just was walking her area. And since then the activities calmed down and she's one of those people that, you know, once it's done and over with, it's done and over with, she doesn't want to go back to it. So that's that story with her and this creature. But what I found it interesting because, you know, the way she was describing the story Almost made it sound like that one case of where you take something from these creatures, they will come back at you and mess with you and force you to do something in an effective, appropriate way if you want to come out of this one unharmed. So in doing so with that airy presence that her dog got and the teeth that she took all played a factor in this encounter. The final encounter I want to share with you is the story. You had a guest on your show. I'm going to call him Joseph. I actually convinced him to come on your show. And he was telling me where he lives now. His friend in Florida was telling him that on this golf course he works at, and this is interesting because you're not getting many golf course incidents with these creatures because it's such thick land, but it's a lot of activity within the borders. And he was saying that he was on the golf course one day just picking up the balls, and he saw this large canine, just this giant German Shepherd head creature that just came out of the blue, walking, looking at him. And walking just like that. And when he was telling me the message, and he was this was over Messenger on Facebook, and I said to him, I was like, Well, I mean, has your friend quit his job or did he just wet his trousers? Because, you know, the way he described this friend made it sound like this guy was afraid of his own shadow, but in a good way. He knows it's there. When he saw the thing, you could smell the flesh. And I forgot to bring this out in the encounters, too. Jane didn't say anything about an odor. But she smelt a little bit what looked like – smelt like skunk. And then there was another one. My friend Ricky and my other friend Alexander smelt urine and smelt like feces odor, like you know, definitely defecation odor, something that doesn't smell appropriately right. And then the Somerset Encounters didn't have any stench or odor. that wasn't described in the comments. But back to the golf course – incident he had said that his friend smelt like what it smelt like rotten flesh or urine so that was partially convinced and he said it was a canine had a german shepherd's head this and that and it was tall roughly eight feet just like the regular report is and he says that he hasn't seen it since this incident that happened in the early spring but he is partially convinced that it's still there and it probably watches him 
he feels that presence. And I kind of hope for him, along with my friends, to eventually come out a little bit more about it now that I'm telling the stories, even Jane's encounter, because those are all the encounters I have. But that's what I've collected so far. And in each of these stories, it is incredible how they're just telling these stories. And it just there's a lot of incidents that play into it, whether retaliation on Jane's part. Or just a warning sign, like a growl, like my friends. And then there was, of course, the Somerset incident, which was not much, but almost as if it was just kind of just crossing away saying, hey, guys. And then the golf course incident, which was just basic. But that's all my encounters from the start to finish of what I've collected and what people told me. One of the frustrating things about doing what we do, Chris, is the fact that there are so many people out there that still for some reason think it would be fun to have an encounter with a dog man. What they don't realize is what people like the woman you just mentioned go through in some cases. Absolutely, Vic. And let me tell you something. You know, when I first got into this stuff, I was one of those hardcore people who were like, oh, I want to have an encounter with one. I'm hyped, man. I would love to see one. Then I look at the stories, I listen to the stories, and I went from I want to see one to no, because I'm a big guy, but even myself, I'm not convinced that I would want to see one because, you know, if you ever seen a big guy, big man ever haul out of a wood territory in general, it's rare, and that's me. I would never want to see one, ever. And that's just coming from a guy who does research. I mean, if I have to see one, I would hope it'd be accidental. Or if it were in case, you know, I'd be with friends or people that I can rely on who's had experience in the woods as myself and, you know, are prepared. Because, you know, seeing one solo is a no-go for me. Well, I can understand that and appreciate that. Since you just mentioned that, that brings up a question I want to throw at you for some clarity here. I know about an outing that's scheduled for this August that you're supposed to participate in. If you don't want to have an encounter with one of these things, why go on an outing like that? Well, like I said, I mean, if it was accidental, but at the same time, if it was with friends or if it was just with people, like, because I am going with a couple friends, one of them actually being Alex, who wants to go back, I convinced them in a way to say, hey, man, we want to go back to this place. You know, I'll be around. I'll have a couple other people around, you know, and, you know, we'll all be respectful coworkers, this and that. And obviously, while they're there to enjoy the trip, I'm going to be there. And obviously, with Alex, just, you know, waiting for something to happen. But, you know, I feel that the more you're with people and this is the less case you'll have an encounter, you're not going to really get much out of it. But even if you're maybe a couple yards and just go for a little stroll, maybe you'll find something. Maybe you'll see something that scopes your area. But as long as you have, let's just say, for example, if this creature wants to take out me or take out my friend or take out any other person, a coworker. They're going to have to take out more than just me. They're going to have to take out eight people that are coming on this outing. And I don't think they're ready to – they're smart enough not to have a body count that could get the public a stir. You know what I mean? They're smarter than that. But like I said, I mean when you're with a party of people or if you're in general, you're with a couple people and you know if it's accidental, it's accidental. I still keep a lust if I want to see one, if I do see one. But at the same time, you got to be cautious. Since discovering these creatures, I'm more cautious of how I am in the woods now than, let's just say, when I was before 2009, when I started going into the research. But back then, you can't convince a teenager, or in this case for me, preteen, before 2009, around that era, that you're not going to sit there and believe in these things. But being cautious, if it does happen, it happens. But, you know, I've learned from people who've had encounters and from people who are professional, well, obviously researchers who've had the experience to not do things that will get it PO'd. And those are the guidelines, I think, in my personal opinion, Vic, that, you know, as long as you know what's the outcome of this and you're prepared and cautious – I think there's nothing really to be afraid of with the exception of if this thing comes right at you or if you're unarmed or if you're not prepared for it. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. 
For the listeners who think there are no dog men in England, Chris, please tell us about the interesting conversation you had with that woman from England. This is interesting. Now, one of my favorite werewolf movies is American Werewolf in London. That's like a spiritual movie to me. It's like every Halloween, it's like a ritual. You got to watch it. And in general, and every year, because that was one of my first horror movies I ever watched. But on subject, I am also an administrator of a UK group for dogmen. And I had befriended a couple of friends in the UK who, and one of the girls I spoke to was telling me how, where they filmed American Werewolf, which was in Wales, in the Welsh Moors, there have been reports of these creatures not looking similar to that of the movie, but that of just regular canine variants, just roaming the moors and roaming the woods. Whether they're partially convinced that the locals who are there see this and they will probably keep a quiet basis, much like the slaughtered lamb in the movie, that these things are out there and for what this case may be europe being one of the the original continent where the werewolf phenomenon began it does not surprise me if you know supernatural forces or the immortality or that of just regular variants who've migrated to there and people often forget that these creatures can swim they can swim underwater they can swim do this and that i know that sounds a little far-fetched and a little asinine but You know, some of the reports that you've listened to, especially in Michigan, of these creatures that could swim and come fast at boats, it's possible. Or they're just regular creatures people have seen just in general down there. It wouldn't surprise me if a movie production like American Werewolf in London, you know, was told some information about the area prior to keep an open eye out and be bassist. Now, I don't know if John Landis or any Rick Baker in general out there would think about that, but it wouldn't surprise me. If anything, in any wooded area, any slasher movie, any horror movie that takes place in the woods, they're given some sort of information that's meant to be on the hush-hush about that area. But that, that basically, yeah, that, that's what the woman in the UK told me, that there's literally a real-life American werewolf, and it's in the area. And the slaughtered lamb is not legitimately called the slaughtered lamb. It's a pub if people do the research. And it wouldn't surprise me if you leave that pub and you're traveling a couple miles to get back into town that you happen to run into these creatures. It does not surprise nobody around that area. I wouldn't say because I'm not from the UK that the people around the locals are hush-hush about it, but they know of it. If they don't know of it, then they've obviously aren't ready to be prepared for what they're about to hear about these creatures. But yeah, that's basically it. She just said straight out that, you know, she saw that she had heard about this because she's not too far from there, but she has heard the stories about. And since she's gotten into Dogman, it's told about the real life American werewolf in London. There is a UK NADP member. And if he is by any chance convinced and see if he can go out there and kind of do a little bit of research himself. And I have another woman who's on board to listen and hear up on the stories of the real life American world. I see if they can get in contact with her and maybe get in contact with the representative out there to see if they can kind of get together and get a little bit more intel on it. Because it's a very interesting case if a, a real life rendition of that movie being real life. It's pretty interesting, Vic. And I didn't know about it until literally about a month ago. As far as what you said about the moors, can you imagine being out on the moors on a foggy night and having a dogman encounter? It doesn't get much worse than that. Here's how I see it. Here's the two combinations. The, the One of the best howls ever recorded in Hollywood cinema with from that movie and seeing an eight-foot creature with that howl staring right at you is enough for me to say, I'm done. That's just how I see it. And that's just brutal. And that movie, when I first saw it, gave me nightmares. And seeing it again, you know, solo by myself, it's still creepy. Because it's just, you know, the idea that now it's even more creepier that this is a real reality. So every time they cut to the scene in the moors and, and, you know, they're being stalked by this creature, I just, you know, get that anxious feeling now. Like, you know, that they're definitely being people in real life. And I would hope to God it never happens to nobody, that they're being watched something's out there and it's not human it could be a human in a shape-shifted form but this thing isn't going to come up to you and say hello how are you doing i'm just lost in the moors at night can you help me get back to town 
it's not going to be one of those cases. It's going to be a much more brutal, scarier case, much like 85 percent of all the encounters that take place here in North America. Yeah, I just can't imagine going out that way. That'd be horrible. To tell you the truth, you know, I'm not getting into death, but you know what? I mean, the one of the things on my list of I would never want to be, you know, mauled or disarrayed by a werewolf or a dog man in this case. Never, ever. Yeah, that wouldn't be a good way to go out. Is there a certain encounter that stands out in your mind as being the most notable one that's been shared with you? There's two. And one is definitely Jane's, and the other one was coming from my friend Alexander when he told me about the vocals he heard. Now, a little funny side fact is that I actually went onto the NADP website, and I played him the three vocals that they have under the evidence folder. The one vocal that they have, the first vocal, which sounds almost like a dog shrieking and then a dog bark, that's the exact similar sound he heard in the Pine Barrens. For us, imagine hearing that at the just campfire at the middle of the night, you know, I'd probably have to get a change of drawers following that incident. But those are the two that stand out to me because they were just completely on point, terrifying. And in Jane's case, I saw it more of like a retaliation because they had either she where she was at was in territory she shouldn't have belonged in. And the fact that she stole teeth from them, which definitely was a huge negative. That's the kind of stuff right there that when you cross the lines, you're, you get once that infamous saying, you know, once you mess with the bull, you get the horns. In her case, you know, she didn't get the horns, but she got the message right there and then and there, you know, pounding on the house, seeing shadows and messing around, you know. And when she had sent the footprints to my one administrator, my jaw dropped. These footprints are definitely not a Sasquatch. They're definitely not human. Those are canine prints. And that was a good story that she had told me. And I was glad to be part of helping her out with that, as well as Alexander's case, because he was so convinced that he had saw something out of a horror movie. But those are the two best to me at the moment, unless there's another story that I grab that can top that, that involves a whole lot of action. Those are the two best to me. Well, I can understand why those two stand out in your mind so much. Has there ever been a time when you think a dogman was close to you? <laughs> Man, um, well, I'll tell you the truth. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it was close to me, but it definitely gets an idea of who I am. But, you know, at the same time, I'm one of those people that if it's possible to build a respect with these creatures, to try not to get on these creatures' bad sides... And, you know, I'm not out to harm one. I'm not out to hurt one. I'm anti-kill. I mean, if a creature was coming at me and I had no choice, I would have to defend myself, whether it was using an air horn to disrupt their ears or firing a weapon. But I don't want to harm one. But just the idea to build a respect with one of these creatures and to know that I'm not out to cause any hysteria with them, just to see me as the one human being that they can say is – my ridiculous little visitor, the human that lives in the house that does all these mysterious episodes and shows type person. But I have animals in my house, and they don't act weird. Then you can tell when an animal can pick up another scent of another animal. And a dog man's an animal. People tend to make it sound like it's an it or a thing. It's an animal. And if it could bleed, go to the bathroom like a regular animal can, it's an animal. But anyways, they don't feel weird. They don't get a sense of anything out there that makes them sound mysterious or just makes them panic. So if they are around me, they're not far from me. I do live in a residential area, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to come and visit. There's been reports of them in residential areas before. And this would not be one of those cases, be nothing new to the ordinary human being. But it does stand out. If they are near me, then they're not going to visit me just yet. And I know that sounds creepy, but that's just how I see it. They're not ready to see me just yet. What do you think is the most impressive piece of readily accessible evidence pointing towards the existence of dog men? Well, uh, this is going to sound cliche, but I think the best piece of evidence that comes is, and I know it's not technically, but it is, te I'm wrong, it is technically considered evidence, is the eyewitnesses reports, what they say. When I get people that come to the Facebook group who join in and are interested in these groups and the subject, 
even on my show, even who are interested in this type of stuff, the eyewitnesses and people who are fascinated with these creatures, such as myself, when I started out in 2009, that's the best piece when it comes to a dog man. You know, because the funny thing is, too, is that I've never been sent HD video footage or footage I can't submit to the public because of all the risks it takes. And people tend to forget that. But when people come forward and they come as like a – not a cult. I wouldn't want to call it a cult, but as a movement that just comes at you and want to know this or they've had an encounter that. And the idea that this is not just an average person coming at you, even my friends, they're telling you something that's changed their lives or they, they're fascinated with that they just love to just you know, want to let out. You know, Marines who've had incidents with these creatures, PTSD is already in their brains from what they've encountered in war. But when they see one of these things, their mindsets just go out of control. But that's the best piece of evidence is the eyewitnesses that come forward and the people who are interested in it. Because to be honest with you, Vic, and we have the same opinion on it, Dogman is definitely – The number two, if anything, in the top five lists of cryptids, Sasquatch being number one, it's there and it's growing big with the encounters that are coming left and right. It's wild. Yeah, it definitely does seem to be gaining steam, to say the least. What percentage of the 911 cases do you think dogmen are responsible for? Well, when it comes to 911 cases, you know... It's hard to say because, you know, there's so much action that happens in the modern day world that 911 incidents are just rapid in general. But when it comes to reports, when it comes to the dogmen, I think in many cases, and this is going to sound like a ridiculous number and it's a little out of the basis in an odd number standpoint, but I at least think that maybe 45% of 911 reports, especially cases involving calls with dogmen or anything involved similar to that, are responsible, especially when they come out with the air quote unquote animal report of this attack, especially when it comes to bear maulings. Everybody blames the bear. You know, when they describe what happens to this creature, but it's black boxed in a way. Boom, 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 bear. Bear, 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 bear. When really, is it really a bear? Or was it just, you know, saying it's a bear because you don't want to tell the public, which I can understand the public, why these things are out there. But, you know, that's just an opening up a can of worms of hunters and fear mongering that the public doesn't want to have or deal with, especially if they never seen one. But they are out there. My friend, you know, the two of them even said it. I asked this question. I was like, do you wish this thing existed? And their heads shook so fast in a negative no fashion that it was just – I was surprised. And I I have to agree with that. I don't think anybody would want to see these creatures exist, but they do. And unfortunately, the people who see them are scarred, traumatized. And there's no question that those people have probably called the police dozens of times. There's a case in Jefferson in 1972 of a woman who called the police – that this creature was banging on her door trying to get into the house and went to the ranch and slashed a horse. The horse was alive, but, you know, the sheriffs, you know, that's another case of just, you know, this creature can do things a human can do, get into cars, walk casually down the road, just in those two reports I talked about. They can do things humans can do, and it has that Planet of the Apes effect to it. But I think that's as close as we're going to get. But back to the 911 thing, it's big and popular there. It's wild. I think they are responsible 45% of the time. I'm not sure what the percentage that they would be responsible for would be, but I think they're a lot more likely to cause incidents like that to happen than, say, a Sasquatch would. There was an infamous 911 call of a Sasquatch. A guy called the police up in the 90s about a creature that was terrorizing his neighborhood, and the dog he had was killed. It was thrown about maybe 50 feet from his house. When you try to explain to a cop that you're seeing a creature that is huge and it's not a bear and it's trying to do things, on the other side of that line, the cop probably thinks of a dispatcher, another cop, a dispatcher. 
thinks you're nuts. And that's where ridicule comes in. So they have to go out and investigate regardless, but they probably think to themselves that these people are seeing things. So to think the idea of their execution of people who call the police works, to say, ha, 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 I get the last laugh. I'm far gone from here. But, you know, you're having these people come out wasting their time. But we know that you saw us and we're here to stay. And that's where it goes from there. Yeah, that's an awfully tough situation to be in. You have to really feel for these people. Well, it's about that time, Chris. Before you give us your closing comments, though, please tell us more about your show and how the listeners can hear it. Well, Crypto Normal X is a show that basically, thanks to the man himself, Vic Cundiff, I uh, was inspired to do. Also because I felt that now that a lot of people are somewhat knowing what I do on the side, of what I do is this and what I bring to the table. I feel that having a show that talks about cryptozoology and paranormal, much like the last guy, is an importance. And to have a younger generation such as myself come in and pitch in and say that, you know, you can have all the veterans who've done this for a while, but I have someone who's interested, even if it's just me and a small portion interest in this stuff that want to listen in and what i bring to the show and my show of course for some people before we go further it's not a show i have a no filter tolerance on my show because i feel that if people are going to tell their encounters i want them to let it all out and i also you know the show is still relatively new it's been out since march you know it's not that one show where we talk for an hour and we put a recording of an hour. I can go on for two or three hours and edit it out, but make it out to be two to three hours long and have people just talk, talk, and talk. And uh, whether people see these shows for entertainment or they see these shows for intelligence, much like I see your show as intelligence to learn about these creatures, it's important to note that it's an important factor in keeping the show alive and having a younger generation tell stories of cryptozoology and paranormal, especially try to tie them in together because they do link in a certain way. Much like human and ape, there is a missing link. But basically, Crypto Normal X, you know, I don't do the show for, you know, fun. I do the show for research, listening, and to have fun. That's what I meant to say. But I also want to let people know that, you know, it's not just dedicated to one subject. We're telling more than one subject, but we want people to be interested and listen that you're not just listening to a guy who's out there to ridicule people. You listen to somebody who wants to learn more, but wants to help people out as well, which is the reason why when I do my show, you know, I don't try to be the same individual or copy another host have the same old phenomenon go on and on and on and on and then you know similar format but try to change it up a bit and i think that's what makes the sparkling of crypto normal x happen so for all those listeners out there who listen to my encounters that i collected and want to check out crypto normal x you know it's simple crypto normal x c r y p t o n o r m a l and x is what you need to research on YouTube. It's on YouTube. There's also a Facebook group called Crypto Normal X Official YouTube and Discussion Group, which is my group. That is a, if you want to join in, feel free. You know, guys, share your story, share everything you want to talk about, what you want to learn. And of course, Crypto Normal X airs every Saturday night. So that's basically it with Crypto Normal X. You know, it's a very good show. You know, we do a lot of stuff on the show. Simon Young, who everybody knows from the Bigfoot Eyewitness show, the sister show of Dogman Encounters, and then David Kyleman of Dogman Encounters Episode 5, are two co-hosts I have from time and time on. We interviewed Vic. Our biggest interview was Vic and Jody Cook's interview. So guys, you're looking for, if you, like I said, entertainment or information-wise, feel free to tap on forward. That's basically it for uh, Crypto Normal X, what I wanted to talk about with that. If you haven't checked out Chris's show yet, you really should check it out. I'm going to post a link for it in the description of tonight's show so you know. Well, Chris, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, if there's one thing, and if Vic hasn't said it, or you don't recall, I'll say it. 
for people out there who have had an encounter, don't be afraid to sit there and, you know, don't be afraid to say it. You don't even have to say it on a show. You can message Vic, message Jody, message me, anybody, whether it's Dogman, Sasquatch, you know, you're telling your story. If you do not have a family that doesn't believe you or friends that don't believe you, you have people who are total strangers to you, but they believe your story and they want to be there to help you. And don't be afraid also to test your endeavors and try to contact with other people and to ask questions about this stuff. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Questions are questions. And always just follow what you do. Don't be afraid to do anything. You believe in yourself, and that's enough belief in your system to believe that you can do anything. And I mean that too. So that's basically in my closing arguments. Just, you know, don't be afraid to do something. Whether you have an encounter, whether you have an interest and you want to learn more about it, don't be afraid. Just say something. That's basically what I got to say on that. Well said. And Chris, thank you for doing what you do. Likewise, brother. Thank you for doing what you do as well and being a huge icon and helping out people as well, my friend. (laughs) Well, thanks for the good words, but icon and Vic Cundiff, I just don't see those two going together. But thanks for the compliment nonetheless. Absolutely, buddy. Well, you have yourself a great night, okay? Thank you, Vic. You as well. Good night, everybody. And including yourself, Vic, you guys have a fantastic evening. Thanks again so much for coming on, and have a good night. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.